Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. So do us a favor, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell for notifications, and of course, participate in the conversation by commenting down below and upvoting the video itself. I am here with Derek Vandegrift, and we are here for our first weekend preview episode that we are going to do. I'm going to release this as, as a standalone on, I think, Wednesday night. And um, that way you have plenty of time to get ready for this weekend. But we're getting ready for the Delaware Blue Hens. And Derek, I'm just going to let you know, all I know about Delaware is a truck stop on I-95 between Pittsburgh and Maryland. And I've probably stopped there 30 times, but that's all that I know about Delaware. What have you got for me? Uh, well, it, it sounds like you know a lot more about Delaware than I do. Uh, I've I've been doing some digging the last few days, trying to find some information on their baseball team. Was able to come up with a little bit, but uh, yeah, uh, apparently there's not just a whole lot of beat writers out there for the Blue Hens. Yeah, and and I'm gonna be perfectly honest to our listener base. I until probably 30 minutes before the podcast, I thought it was Delaware State. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we we get the Blue Hens in this weekend. It's uh, you know. Definitely not going to be the toughest test for for the defending and reigning national champions of college baseball, but you know it'll be a nice little warm up for us. Yes, how we're going to lead every podcast on Ole Miss baseball off for the next four months is defending national championship. Yeah, that that's exactly right. Up until mm-hmm. we win it again, then we will be the reigning champions again, back to back. Yes, and then we can do three peat. Like maybe yep. we have to pay Phil Jackson or Pat Riley, whoever owns that trademark, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get it going, man. You know, uh, last year was obviously a ton of fun. You know, do, j- jumping on here every week with you, talking about that team through the highs and the lows, and you know, now it's kind of a breath of fresh air. You know, we don't have that big cloud hanging over the program anymore. We can really just focus on baseball, not what the future holds for. So, I'm, um, I'm really excited to get this season started, and it's going to be one that we haven't seen in a really long time with you know, just that monkey off of our back where we can just go and play baseball for an entire season. Yeah, and let's, you know, I don't want to say turn the page. We certainly should enjoy being national champions. But there's some rule changes for this year. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, yeah. You know, I've I've been reading up on those too. Uh, I'm I'm really interested to see how – firm they're going to enforce this this new pitch clock right the the 20 second pitch clock coming in and then the 30 second batter rule uh you know and and the batter has all the way up to like five seconds to get ready uh before it's called a strike on him otherwise if he's ready for that and the pitcher doesn't throw it it's an automatic ball um but then you know you've got the what is it 30 seconds for a mound visit and, and stuff like that and uh, so many pickoff attempts before you have to go home. You know, uh, it's it's definitely going to take a lot of getting used to going into this year. And I'm just more interested to see how much they enforce these new rules because it's so new on everybody. Um, you know, I know Schloss and Eagle down at A&M is just going to have an absolute fit with 20 seconds for or between pitches. He wants to drag it out so dang much all the time. But I'm I'm sure he'll find ways to you know get some dust in the eye or. or or a contact folding over something like that to get get time to kind of extend this out a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, it, it. I was about to say even before you brought it up that Texas A and M series last year was almost unwatchable, like four hour games. It, it, it was uh-huh. it, it was like a trip to the dentist, honestly. Yeah, yeah, and look, the as far as the rules being put in place, I don't really like all of them, but I understand why they're getting put in place. You know, I'm, I'm a big college baseball fan. I, I can sit there and I can watch, uh, you know, an Ole Miss game or another college baseball game for four plus hours. I know that's not appealing to everybody though. We've got to grow the sport. We've got to make it more appealing and we got to get it down to where the, to where ESPN and, and different television networks can start carrying college baseball more than what they already are. And it's hard to do it with, you know, a game that might last three hours all the way up to four, four and a half hours. You know, you, you got to bring it down a little bit. That way they can block off a slot for you and, you know, get in there, play the game, get it over with. I mean, it's a good product when, when it's going and moving and flowing the way it should be. And uh, so it hopefully that'll help get college baseball more into the national spotlight and get it carried on more television, what we're seeing right now. 
And one thing that's amazing, I mean, we have come a long way since Greg Maddox threw a 76-pitch complete game. I mean, (laughs) so long, it's so arduous, but, like, it seems like you would watch a baseball game in the 90s that was on TV, just Mm -hmm. everything. Greg Maddox pitch, it'd be two hours and 50 minutes, and you're out the door. Now, now it's like, well, we got to get it under four hours. And they're like, how? Yeah, yeah. Now it's one of those where you start a slab of ribs at first pitch, and then by the time the game's over, you're finally pulling it off four hours later, and you're ready to eat, kind of, kind of get something on your belly and sober up a little bit after all that, you know. But, but yeah, that's that's a little too long for games to be going. Uh, you know, I I can sit there and watch it all day, but I know most casual baseball fans can't, so I understand why they're doing it. Um, it sounds like Mike Bianco is really putting emphasis on it during all of these uh, spring practices leading up to the uh season and all that uh with with umpires they had brought in he uh told them to to make sure to really put an emphasis on that 20 second pitch clock to make sure those guys are are ready to go as soon as the ball gets back to them all right let's move on the delaware blue hens um they are in fact from delaware they're probably enjoying some warmer weather down south although i think it's supposed to be like 41 degrees friday so i mean it's a typical like it's it's like 71, 72 here right now. We're going to be in the 70s again tomorrow. And then by the time first pitch rolls around on Friday, we're going to be up in the upper 40s and then mid-50s for Saturday and Sunday too. You know, I'd have given anything for a 70-degree opening day. All right. So what do we need to know about the Delaware Blue Hens? Uh, well, they're out of the Colonial Athletic Association. They're not a particularly good team. They are projected to finish ninth out of the 11 teams in that conference. Uh, but supposedly they can hit the ball pretty well. That's That seems to be what everybody talked about when I was reading season previews and stuff like that on them. Uh, they, they had a really good fall hitting the ball. They brought in a second baseman, Dan Cavino, out of uh, <clears throat> Central Connecticut. And, uh, you know, he, he had a 1,020 OPS at Central Connecticut last year. So uh, a guy that can swing it a little bit. Now, he is the only player on that entire team that's in the top 25 prospects in the CAA. And he comes in at number 24 of 25. So take that for what you will. You know, it's, it's not a, a lineup just absolutely stacked with boppers up and down uh, – one to nine or anything like that. But, you know, they, they do have some capable players. Uh, their third baseman, jo- Joey Loyne, he was a first-team all-CAA player last year. Hit 298, eight home runs, 45 RBIs, uh, 891 OPS. So he's a guy that can swing it a little bit. Uh, their DH, Bryce Greenlee, he's a guy you need to keep an eye on, especially with us changing catchers. We're going to have Calvin Harris back there playing catcher for us this year. And he's kind of their speeder. He's going to get on base hit for a good average, not a whole lot of pop, but he stole 16 bases last year, so he's kind of the table setter for them. So that's one guy we'll keep an eye on uh, at the top of their lineup and, and try to keep him off base before Joey Loyne or the shortstop J.J. Freeman comes up. He was another player that played really well last year. He hit 270 and 834 OPS and uh, was able to get it out of the ballpark nine times. So he's he's got, he's got a little bit of pop uh pretty good hitter and a good defender too that's one thing this team does do they're a really good defensive team they're not going to get out there and just beat themselves and and give us extra outs so that's that's one thing you got to look for uh they got a juco catcher that's coming in that's supposed to be really really good so you know it'll be interesting to see how he performs get going from juco up to division one uh his name is jose armando diaz and he had a OPS over 1,200 last year. So uh, he's he's a guy that can really swing it. So it'll be interesting to see what he's able to do against some top-level pitching this weekend uh, with Elliott and Saunier and those guys coming in. So uh, pretty good lineup, though, you know, one that you definitely don't want to take lightly. And like I said, it's a defense that's not going to give out extra out. So, uh, you know, their, their question seems to be the pitching. Their best returning pitcher that I could find – is actually their, or was their number three starter, but he hadn't pitched in two years due to injuries. So it seems like them on the mound is where it's really going to be a problem. And against the lineup, Ole Miss is going to be throwing out there. It could be a really, really big problem for them here starting Friday. Yeah, and I say this, um, but before I say it, I want to let everybody know, there will be no discussion about the Mike Bianco job anywhere on this podcast all year. He has deserved 
two or three years of no discussion on that. So take yeah. everything that we say in that lens and um, and with that grain of salt and make sure that it's all relative. Now, I'm going to say this. This is a series that Ole Miss should win all three, right? Yes, it is a series we should win all three. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's baseball is baseball. Weird things happen and all that. But, yeah, I would be shocked to come, you know, Sunday evening if you know we we haven't gone ahead and taken all three of these and turned our attention to Arkansas State on Tuesday and then of course next weekend the big series against Maryland. Yeah, it uh, it's, it's all a warm up to get going. Now, yeah, another question: Hunter Elliott, he's probably going to be the Friday starter, mm -hmm. um, as they call him, Little Doug. How long before he is no longer known as Little Doug and is just known as Hunter? Uh, well, you know, I, I kind of think he's there already. You know, he's already done something that Doug hadn't done. He uh, pitched in the national championship game and won it. You know, uh, he had an incredible year for us last year. Obviously, we couldn't have done what we did last year without Hunter Elliott and Dylan DeLucia. You know, those two really stepped up and more or less kind of came out of nowhere halfway through the year and really put us on their backs and said, just follow us, guys. You know, I'm, I'm going to get you there. If you hit enough, these two guys here are, are, are going to pitch it, you know, and, and, and they did. And, you know, he's, he's getting all the accolades too. Fresh or uh, preseason all American, freshman all American last year, uh, obviously pitched in the deciding game for us in Omaha. Uh, just an incredible player, incredible pitcher, not going to blow you away with his stuff, but, but he knows how to pitch. He knows how to locate. Um, and he's just a competitor up there, right? You know, nothing, nothing gets to him. Go back to that, game against Miami in the first inning when he's got the bases loaded, no outs. And, you know, it was just, okay, I'm just going to go up there and I'm going to throw strikes and I'm going to get outs and I'm going to get out of this inning. And that's exactly what he did for us. And I expect the exact same thing from him this year. It'll be a little different being the Friday night guy. There's more expectations and pressure that comes with that. Uh, but if anybody could, could kind of over – come all of that pressure and expectations. It's a guy like Connor Elliott with the demeanor he has that is very much like Doug McCasey's. Yes. Tonight's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the midway point of the NBA season. It's here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your bet first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sports app. It's safe and secure and super easy to use. I do realize that in Mississippi, you have to go to a retail place. But if you're in Memphis, if you're doing that, obviously you can use the FanDuel app then. If you're down in Louisiana, you can use it there. So just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drain. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets at a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss out on the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. When you go to fanduel.com slash locked on, that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with Fanduel. It's an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Also, Thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. So do us a favor, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell for notifications, and of course, comment down below and upvote the video itself. Okay, and I'm here with Derek Vandegrift. We're going over the big season, or big game series this weekend between the Ole Miss Rebels and the Delaware Blue Hens. Um, so... Give me some players that we need to watch from the Ole Miss baseball team this weekend. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's obviously new faces that we all want to see play, right? Uh, I, I think first and foremost is Ethan Groff there in center field. <clears throat> He'll take over center field with uh, T.J. McCant sliding over to a corner outfield spot. That is my assumption at least. But then Groff would take over the leadoff spot here and, and kind of set the table for a really good lineup for Ole Miss and – you know, this is a guy that before he got hurt last year, he was hitting over 400. He's a power speed guy, really, really good defender out there at center, can really run down balls. Um, so that's one guy I want to see. Um, you know, Anthony Calarco, the first base transfer out of Northwestern. You know, he's he's a really big bat. You know, he's, he was able to hit 13 home runs up there in, 
and at Northwestern playing in cold games basically all year long, you know. So when he comes down here and starts warming up a little bit, you could, you know, probably see where his balls would start flying out of the yard a little bit more, get up 15, 16, 17 home runs this year, kind of help replace the power we're losing with uh, Graham and Elko and all those guys not being here this year. So, uh, you know, him and, you know, kind of the guy I'm going to be riding all year long. And, you know, I, I think Scott's going to win out the DH spot real furnace. You know, uh, I talked about him back when he signed with Ole Miss. I hopped on here and we did a, a signing day show with uh, all the recruits and all that, and that was one guy that stuck out to me just because of how hard he hits the ball. He makes a lot of contact, and when he does, it, it, it can really fly out of the yard. Uh, big left-handed power bat. Uh, you know, people that's followed baseball for a while are real familiar with his dad playing down at LSU. Probably still having nightmares of him, if I had to guess. Uh, but, you a couple know, of his home runs aren't, haven't landed yet. Yeah, yeah. So, But but now it's Will's time to uh, to give the LSU fans a few nightmares for the next few years wearing that Rebel jersey. So really excited to see what he's going to do for us. Uh, you know, but then we got guys returning. I, I think this could be the year T.J. McCants really breaks out for us. Uh, you know, that, that young kid had, had a lot of stuff going on last year, and he started off so hot, playing so well, and that was the, you know, the the level we thought that, that he could get to. And, uh, you know, and now we know what all happened with his mother and all that and all, all, all the stuff he had to deal with last season. Uh, so hopefully he can bounce back and, and really have a, a good year and get the, get his draft stock raised back up you know he was a top 75 prospect going into last year in the mlb draft so really talented kid hopefully he can finally put it all together for a full season uh and if he does you know then you really have to watch out because top to bottom this could end up being a better lineup one through nine than what we put on the field last year um and then you go over to the pitching side you know that's that's where the questions are and if you gave me a choice of do I need hitters to prove it or pitchers to prove it? I want pitchers to prove it because that's what Mike Bianco and this staff has done for 20-something years now is ran out a pitching staff, whether you've seen it yet or not, that just ends up finding a way to figure it out, to pitch in big games. And, uh, you know, we're going to be relying on a lot of new faces and, and, and young arms there. Uh, we've talked about him several times on this show, but Grayson Saunier, the incredible freshman, you know, uh, Mike expects to pitch him this weekend. I don't know if he'll start or come out of the bullpen. Apparently, he had some uh, tricep tenderness earlier or uh, last weekend that scratched him from his intra squad start Saturday. Uh, but it doesn't sound like a big deal, and Mike expects him to throw one way or another. Uh, but I think that's your sure enough Saturday starter. And uh, everything I'm hearing, it sounds like Xavier Rivas is going to get the first crack at Sunday's for us. You know, the crafty lefty from D2 Indianapolis coming up. And, uh, you know, it would be really interesting to see what he's able to do. But then you've got JT Quinn and uh, Tukoian, um, different guys that, that could start against Arkansas State coming up in the midweeks. And that's kind of where Mike Bianco has used these young guys to kind of mold them a little bit. If you remember back uh, Jack Doherty's freshman year, he ended up taking the red shirt off of him and started pitching him in midweek games. And that's where he kind of molded himself into the pitcher he was. And then he started incorporating him out of the bullpen during SEC play and then finally starting his freshman year there on the back end in SEC play. So that's that's kind of Mike Bianco's MO, use those young guys in those midweek games, kind of get, get them some experience, learn how to pitch. Uh, so I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't see that again this year. Um, and then it's all about the bullpen after that. You want to keep Jack Doherty on the back end, him and Mason Nichols, and then you got to find some guys to kind of bridge the gap a little bit. And uh, one guy I'm really looking at this year, I think it's time for Jackson Kimbrell to step up. You know, we, we need that lefty out of the bullpen. He's He looked good last year in, in the small samples that we had out of him. Uh, but, you know, he's another year older, and so it's, it's time for him to come in and, and be that big lefty out of the bullpen that gives us some outs when we need them. All right, before we get out of here, tell the people what they need to expect in February. What does Ole Miss want to get out of February? As many players playing as possible. I mean, you're you're going to see lineup changes, shifts, people batting in different orders. You're going to see different guys plugged into the lineup. Uh, not only in the weekend, but in the midweek too. You know, you're probably going to see, you know, for example, Kemp Alderman's our backup catcher. You're probably going to see him 
you know, maybe catch some games in the midweek just to get him some work there. Um, and then guys like Taiwan Malone and uh, uh, Banks Tolley and, and Garrett Wood, uh, Reagan Burford, those kind of guys, you know, they're going to keep getting mixed in and out of the lineup so they can be sharp if we do need them later on in the year. You know, one, one thing that we learned last year is, you know, we, we needed the depth that we had. We were a very deep team. And then you look up and you've got Garrett Wood starting in the uh, regional final and then through the super regionals, right? And, uh, you know, that was a real big boost to us. And there was about a five or six game stretch there where John Kramer and Banks Tolley there in the outfield were really big for us to help us bridge the gap until some more guys were able to get healthy, you know, with Graham out and stuff like that. So, you know, those those kind of guys are going to get at bats. It, what you see him run out Friday night's not going to be what you see necessarily Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, or the next weekend either. <clears throat> but then also these young guys, a lot of pitches, right? You want to get as many guys into games as possible. You don't want to come out and stretch out your starters to go seven, eight innings right off the bat, you know. Get in there, get them five innings. You know, a guy like Hunter, yeah, let him go six or so. But then start incorporating some of these younger guys, some of these freshmen, some of these new faces, or guys that are already in your program like Jackson Kimbrell. And let's let them start working a little bit. Uh, because, again, like last year, you never knew who you were going to need later on in the year. You know, and you see guys like Dylan DeLucia and Hunter Elliott step up when they weren't really getting a lot of opportunities early in the year. All right, thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. It has everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, you get to hear from big-name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball It's available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you very much, Derek. Hey, this is the first weekend for the defending national champion Ole Miss Rebels. They're going to get started and take on the Blue Hens, man. I'm going to look forward to it, and I know you are, bud. Yeah, yeah, man. Can't wait for it to get started, man. And, uh, you know, look look forward to coming on here next week after the Rebels have started 4-0 and and talk about a, a really, really big series in Oxford. Yeah, can't wait for it, man. Take care. All right. Hi, Toddy. Hotty toddy.